great to see ya! One particular memory that I've always had is thanks to the face of this lemur here. This is Zabumafu. Well, actually, the real lemur's name is Jovian. But for context sake, this is Zabumafu, or simply referred to as Zubu. He was the star of the show of the same name that was hosted by Martin and Chris Kratt, brothers who have a love for learning about and teaching about the unique wildlife found all around the world. Falling into the edutainment category, these two would spend their careers making shows that explore this in multiple ways with their biggest impact on me as a child, Zabumafu. Today, I'd like to revisit and explore Zabumafu, how it became the show that it was, what the show was all about, and all of the interesting stuff within and around the show. Whether I got to watch them on my own time at home or the TV would be wheeled into the classroom and instead of Bill Nye, it would be Zabumafu time, it was going to be a great day regardless. Zabumafu. Oh, it's time. So what is Zabumafu? I'm ready for it. Here we go. No, not Zoobly Zoo, Zabumafu. I'm tired of this Jordan Fringe. The show itself really isn't too complicated to get behind. We first get introduced to Chris and Martin Kratt, our two hosts who, as the theme song goes, were just walking in the woods one day and they happened upon a fun adventurous lemur that they proceed to follow and befriend. The main location of the show takes place on the set called the Animal Junction, where the Kratts come in, appreciate nature and all the animals in it like usual, as they begin to introduce us to the theme of the episode before yelling out for their lemur friend, Zabumafu. Zabumafu! Or as they sometimes or most times refer to him as hey, Zabu! And the gimmick here is that after the real lemur comes in and gets his special snack that we watch him eat, he transforms into his puppet form, so that he is able to speak with the host to help out in the teaching of the audience. Good munchies up. And I bet a kangaroo could jump as far as once this is all established, we get a wide variety of segments that continue to play out, from musical numbers, 2D animation, claymation, but we would mainly spend time in live action getting up close with the different animals brought on the show. When we would get shown a new animal, we'd learn all about it, the noises it would make, the habits it would have in nature, and all of the cool facts that you'd want to know about. Zabumafu himself serves as the audience vessel that knows a lot of information but equally has a lot to learn, bringing questions or points of interest interests up so that the Kratts can go further into detail with it. Then there's Zubuland, where Zabumafu recounts tales of him in Zubuland that feature this full-on claymation style, and maybe some of these animations have been locked into the back of your mind for the past couple of decades, but that wave of nostalgia that poured over me when seeing this was indescribable. <laughs> the end. Now this part was more nonsensical to logic and had many other made up animals or creatures that would help play out whatever story or memory that is being brought up by Zabumafu, but it was still a cool treat to see different animation styles being played with in the show. Throughout the rest of a regular episode, we'd get plenty of reoccurring mentions and gags that build up a repetitious rapport with the show. But one segment that made you feel that as a kid, you can be involved is the animal helper segments. These moments would feature some sort of aviary animal flying into the set to give the Kratz a video letter that shows some sort of short story from the kids known as the animal helpers, who are doing great things for animals and their environments they live in. Rabbits love their vegetables. See you later! Giving you tips and information to do your part as well. It's usually a good message about the kind things that you can do for the animals, as well as just useful tips for if you ever find yourself in a situation with a bear, for example. But for the back half of the episode, the two open up their closet, which was a gag that constantly would just drop a bunch of random items on them when they open it so that they can now gear up and head out on a special adventure. Uh, to where, you ask? To wherever. Jump like a fish! Ah! <laughs> Frogs jump far. Back to Animal Junction. Now off of the set and into the great outdoors, the two would really get out there and be in nature, as we would get real footage of the animals in their natural environments, finding food, avoiding enemies, specifically the ones that are usually trying to eat them, and how they just live their life in general. Chris and Martin would just film a bunch of fun bits out in nature nature so that they can splice it into the actual animal footage that they would have, as we would also mix in some voiceover facts about the animals from the brothers before they would return to the junction for more animal
animal shenanigans with Sabumafu. The episode would wrap up with some goofiness and jokes, but before you know it, you get through a whole episode of the show that gave you a bunch of animal information to retain, and a lot of visual fun that was had along the way. So for a lower budget production and operation, what they were able to create out of that and to truly make it engaging for the audience was impressive. But how did this production fully come together? What building blocks led us to these two teaming up with the lemur to teach you all about the animals of the world? That's me. That's me. Right here. That's, see? Me. That's me. Right? That, huh? 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 No, Nate. We're still not talking about Zoobly Zoo. My feelings are hurt. I thought we were friends. Dude, and I was even going to show you my official Zoobly Zoo poster right here that was given to me by one of the cast members, Michael, who played Lookout Bear, and I was even going to show you my uh, Lookout Bear autograph right there by Michael. I was going to show you all of that and more, but not now. Nope. Anyway, let's take a look to see how it all truly came to be. Me, you, and Zaboomafu. It's time for Zaboomafu on PBS Kids Sprout. Later on, it's Big Sister and Little Brother. To put a show like this together, we have to first look at the Kratz brothers. Martin Kratz is the older brother born in December of 1965, with Chris Kratz being born in July of 1969. These two seem to be inseparable when it comes to what they do and how they are referred, often just being known as the Kratz brothers. While in education they went to different colleges, I want to bring up that Martin graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Zoology from Duke University, as Duke will become a larger player in helping make the show what it was. Post school, they both went into their fields further with Martin traveling the world to some really cool places, being able to research and study animals, as Chris, who graduated from Carleton College with a Bachelor of Arts in Biology, went on to intern at the nonprofit Environmental Organization Conservation International before he would start up the Carleton Organization of Biodiversity. PBS, the public broadcast service, is a nonprofit television network that is publicly funded with making sure that they have a focus on educational programming as they have distributed stuff like Arthur and Sesame Street, but in 1994, the more kid-based and educational-based programming was packaged together as a block of content on PBS called PTV. And during this time, where other networks and their kids' programming was on the rise, PBS couldn't necessarily compete budgetary-wise, but they were ambitious to build up what they could with what they had. Here is where Martin and Chris get their big break, with the show Kratz Creatures. But that's something I'll bring up in just a little bit. This connection here would build a strong relationship with PBS and the Kratz, as well as who they were and what they were all about, showcasing and learning about animals. What really stood out was their want and commitment to going and truly documenting these animals in their habitats themselves, not relying on the problem that they had noticed, which was the large use of stock footage in shows similar. From here, once the show had come to an end in 1996, the brothers began work on coming up with their next show idea. While this wasn't their initial career path, it did become a way for these two to showcase their love and interest to a larger audience of kids to hopefully inspire them, and at the bare minimum, teach them in a fun and engaging way about animals. So then, how does the development of this upcoming show turn into one of the co-stars becoming a lemur? Well, going back to Duke University, Martin was already familiar with the lemur center that the school had on campus, and his past interest of studying the lemurs and volunteering at the center helped bring them there to get inspired by them. Well, mainly by one in particular. This is where we meet Jovian a fairly young cockerel she fox lemur at the time who instantly hits it off with the brothers, showing off the personality that he truly has. While they did look into all of the other lemur options at the center, it was clear that Jovian was born for his time on camera. This was the spark that truly put the idea of what this show could be together. A couple more years later, and it's the start of 1999. Now, these specific lemurs are a critically endangered species that are native to Madagascar, but thanks to stuff like deforestation and hunting, the lemurs find their species continuing on thanks to preserves and habitat centers like the one at Duke where we meet Jovian. Or you can find them in the 2000 Disney CGI film I'd like to speak about one day, Dinosaur. Take videotapes of them to study their motions and actions. Uh, they're a little scary when you first get a hold of them. They look like this. They don't have any hair yet. Anyway, PBS had announced and started to shift the PTV programming block into something bigger, a full-on name change and a standalone channel that would be labeled as PBS Kids. This larger focus for them was in more efforts to bring more younger audience-based programs to the channel and to try and compete a bit with the younger skewed blocks from Nickelodeon. One show that came out around this announcement of PBS Kids that would eventually fall under its branding was none other than 
Menza Bumafu, which premiered on January 25th, 1999. Like I mentioned, the show would feature the two brothers here and their new lemur pal Zabumafu, who would be present in the show as his actual self or by a puppet that would speak thanks to the voice of Gord Robertson. The show also just played with techniques for different segments like animated moments or even claymated moments, which again, they are just burned into my brain. But when we would see the live action bits that feature Jovian, the show decided to film at that center, building part of the set right there so Jovian's home is just outside the open window. The show would see some pretty decent ratings from both approval from parents and critics to the audience tuning in to watch, and it truly helped bridge the gap as PBS was building PBS Kids and sunsetting the PTV programming block. Overall, the show produced 65 episodes between two seasons, with the first season containing the majority at a total of 40 episodes, as season two would have nearly half at 25 episodes. The final episode would release on November 21st, 2001, but the show would go on for a while thanks to having enough episodes that PBS can rebroadcast, replay, and fully send into syndication, which at this point, it would cost them nothing as they weren't going to produce anymore. So while the show would spawn toys, VHS releases, and even receiving two official video game releases with Zabumafu Leap and Lemurs on the PlayStation 1 and Zabumafu Playtime in Zubuland for the Game Boy Color, giving you something to either play on the couch or something to play on the go, it seemed like the presence of the show was larger than the actual show itself. Now, clearly the show was popular and had that moment that they were looking for to have any sort of competitive feel to Nickelodeon. The IP was helping push the network, but even that, for some reason, couldn't justify a season three. So any more brand awareness would be from the same episodes just re-shown here and there for years to come. But 65 episodes is still a massive number of episodes, with each of them having so much range because they're all different from the last. But one thing that never changed was our vessel into this animal junction, Zabumafu, and all of the ways that he was portrayed on the show, interacting with the Kratz and bringing us a very unique animal to cheer on as the mascot and learn all about. I think a big reason why a show like this works really well is that it can appeal to both a younger audience, but not alienate an older one, or make it more of a pain to watch for the parents. The presentation of the show is very lighthearted and fun, and only offers a welcoming environment for anyone to come and learn about the animals in a natural way. I am a fan of edutainment content. Most times I go into this by saying as long as there feels like an effort to feel that it includes me in on the fun to learn, rather than spout things at me, telling me to understand it, then I am always in full support of it. And I do feel that the show does a great job at inviting the viewer to feel included instead of getting a lecture. Martin and Chris just have this great back and forth energy. One, partly because they are brothers, and two, it's because they love what they do. When they are talking about animals or showing something to the audience, you get the genuine feeling that they truly do enjoy the information that they teach, as well as being in front of the camera, having a natural level of charisma that some people are just born with. I like that as an adult, I still feel like I can learn from this show, looking into the animals and their interesting facts that make them unique. So beyond surface level information, there is genuine knowledge that you can take away from Zabumafu. From the different segments in the show to the different animation styles mixing in with live action, the show for sure left its impact on me as a child, especially for why I love animals so much. And find learning about them really cool and fun. It was shows like this that knew how to make education work with the viewer to retain the information learned by bringing you along on the adventure with some real enthusiasm about it to boot. When it comes to where everything is now, the brothers have been involved in plenty more thanks to their namesake of working together and being known for their work with animals. So where would these two go next, as well as our main star of the show, Jovian? Later on, we'll have an adventure in Animal Junction with Sabumafu. <laughs> in speaking about Zabumafu and our main two charismatic leads here, the relationship that PBS had, or should I say has, with the Kratz was deeper than just the show, but in fact, two others. Now this show, Zabumafu, is the show in the middle of the three shows that they did, and it's the one in which I personally know and recall the best. But beforehand, we had Kratz Creatures, I mentioned this earlier. And then post-Zabumafu, we had the animated series Wild Kratz. Kratz Creatures was 
a short-lived show that was closer to what Zaboomafu was. It lasted from June to August in 1996, but produced 50 episodes, as it would have episodes on PBS Monday through Fridays. The two brothers would feature traveling the world to be the first kids show that focuses on wildlife exploration and knowledge for the younger audience at the time. It even had this animated dinosaur thing who knows a lot about the past, so it's cool that even in their first show they were also mixing animation styles with live action, and it just feels like a nice little staple trait that they have. Now, after Zaboomafu, still for PBS, is the animated show Wild Kratz. This is the animated counterpart to who these brothers were, and a nice level of cartoon antics added in there to make it, you know, cartoony. This is why I use the term has for their relationship with PBS, as Wild Kratz, a show that came out in 2011, is still running to this day with six seasons and 154 episodes already, with a new season starting in May of 2023. Now, I would like to make a video that is solely about Wild Kratz, and if you'd like to see that, let me know. But I'll mention some basic info here. We get introduced to the show by Chris and Martin in their live action form, as they then ask the question, oh, what if they have powers? From there, we enter the animated world of the show, where they have specific creature powers, as we learn a lot about the various animals featured in the show. So overall, pretty on brand for them, I guess, as well. But that's not where our other journeys with the Kratz end. For PBS, sure. But outside of the public broadcast service, let's head over to the National Geographic Channel, where from October of 2003 until April of 2007, the Kratz would put together a documentary show for three seasons, and it would basically feel very similar in bringing both entertainment and learning together called Be the Creature. But it wouldn't be focused on strictly a younger audience, as this would be taking aim at a teenager and older demographic. Suffice to say that these two really knew how to show their love and knowledge of wildlife to their audience. Whether it was back with their three different live action shows or even their still running animated one, I think it's genuinely admirable. While Zabumafu was a big hit for PBS and their focus on making a section of programming just for a younger audience with PBS Kids, the show did come to an end after the second season. Which sure, the 65 episode limit was a thing for a lot of channels at the time, but this ended more so thanks to just having an abundance of episodes that they can just keep in syndication and not have to fund the production of any more. After the show ended in 2001, the show would run in syndication through PBS for a few years, and then through PBS Kids Sprout, now known as Universal Kids, after an acquisition, until the early 2010s right as we'd get into their new animated show. I want to speak about Zaboomafu here for a moment, or the lemur behind Zaboomafu. Like I mentioned, he was played by an actual lemur named Jovian. This face is something I've never forgotten, regardless of the show only lasting two seasons. After the end of the show, he ended up having a solid retirement from the business, being able to father a dozen children, with some of them having their own children as well. Jovian would continue living at the Duke Lemur Center in one of the natural habitat enclosures located in North Carolina, where visitors who took the Walking with Lemurs tour were able to meet the famous Zubumafu. But sadly, on November 10th, 2014, Jovian would unfortunately pass away due to kidney failure, leaving behind a particularly heartwarming legacy from fans of the show growing up with it, and a generational one thanks to Jovian's kids, and their kids as well as his parents still being alive at the time. Jovian was 20 years old at the time of his passing, with many out there sharing their sentiments towards the joyful lemur, as well as the ones even closer to Jovian, the Kratz brothers and Duke University. Martin makes note that Jovian was great to work with, and he is fondly remembered and cherished by the brothers and the university who posted an obituary and legacy page detailing his life onto their website. The posted obituary says, Jovian, a much-loved cockerel she-fuck, has died of kidney failure at the age of 20.5. Jovian was famous as Zabumafu, the leaping, prancing, otherworldly star of the PBS kids show by the same name, hosted by brothers Martin and Chris Kratt. He was a graceful, long-limbed co-star with cream and rust fur and bright, intelligent yellow eyes, and he taught millions of children what a lemur is. The show aired 65 episodes in just over two years, 1999 to 2001, and continues in syndication. Jovian was able to live out the last year of his life enjoying this free-range environment at the lemur center as his health would start to decline. His days were filled with spending time with his family and being looked after to help him eat in peace, separated from the others for about a half hour each time, once his weight started to drop as well. During this, he never lost his spirit, though, and was still as playful as ever, running around and wrestling with the others. From his time on the show until his last days with his family, Jovian was an intelligent, playful, and caring lemur that embodied all that the Kratz brothers wanted to showcase about animals in general. Without Jovian, there is no Zabumafu, so rest easy, little guy.
In the end, Zabumafu will be remembered fondly by those who grew up with the show during its original run, and by those around the world watching the show through its syndication deals. The Kratz brothers are still active today by showcasing their love and interest in exploring and explaining the various amounts of unique animals all around the world. Their animated show, Wild Kratz, is still pumping out new episodes and has some massive support from its audience and strong ratings that prove that interest in this type of edutainment is still there and an incredible way to learn about the world and the creatures we share it with. I would love to know your thoughts on Zabumafu and if you were someone who grew up with the show like I did back at the turn of the century, so let me know in the comments. Thanks so much for watching, like and subscribe for more. Later. You know, Jordan French, I was looking forward to hearing your take on Zoobly Zoo, the adventures of Lookout Bear, Bravo the Fox, Builder Beaver, all of the amazing characters in Zoobly Zoo. And I was even going to wish you a Zooberific day. Not now. Nope. I'm tired of this, Jordan.